A very, very good evening, everyone. I'm back as promised with my short video on literary analysis. And uh, before proceeding ahead, let me welcome you once again to my channel. Thank you so much for being with me. And thank you so much for your suggestions, teachers. I'm grateful to you for sharing, you know, something which I have actually been looking for. So here's the video and it's uh, on one of the poems which I selected, though it's not a very popular one. Nevertheless, uh, this is just for the sake of uh, trying as an experiment. And if I get more likes and uh, I get uh, requests to post some more of similar material, I'll definitely do that because all my videos basically depend on your comments and your suggestions. So here we are. Uh, today's poem which I've selected is uh, one uh, which has been penned down by one of my very, very favorite poets of all times. Uh, he's an American uh, poet in the English language, of course. And uh, before I speak about him and the poem, let me once again welcome you to my channel, which is Eloquent English Enterprise. So here's the presentation. Let's start off. Okay, so today's uh, poem, which I have selected, is The Roadside Stand, which has been written by Robert Frost. And I just mentioned he's one of my favorite poets. Um, so teachers, before you start explaining any poem or any lesson in prose or drama, uh, it's my sincere suggestion that you must give your students a little backdrop uh, about the poem in uh, consideration. And of course, also of the poet or the writer or the novelist or the playwright. So here, when you start off with the roadside stand, you must mention uh, to which country uh, Robert Frost belonged to, what was his genre, what kind of poetry did he write. So um, for starting, we can say that he was an American poet, though, and he was born over there. But most of his po poems or his poetry is set in New England, right? And uh, his parents were accomplished people. His mother was also a teacher. And, you know, you could just uh, get a little more uh, inputs about his life history. Okay, so let's proceed further. And now the summary of this particular poem. Now, I will not explain it um, as per the stanzas. I'll just give the summary. And that's how you also need to teach. Do not explain a poem line by line. Make them understand. Read it. Recite it. Make them recite. Put some feelings into it. Right? So here... Uh, you will tell them that this poem, uh, which has been penned down by Robert Frost, it uh, tells or it denotes or it uh, focuses on a rural family which is struggling for their existence because they have a very small roadside shack. Uh, it's on a highway. And unfortunately, nobody stands, nobody stops over there to buy things from them. They desperately hope, you know, every vehicle uh, approaching the shack, they hope that it's going to stop and they'll do some shopping over here. But unfortunately, the vehicles keep passing by. They do not stop. So this uh, rural setup, this rural family, which has a small little shop, is always ignored by the fast-paced city-oriented traffic. So there are a few themes which I feel have been explored by this poem. I've selected six uh, because it's not necessary that you have to have just one theme of, for, for a particular poem. So the first two, uh, first is economic disparity. Now this uh, shows that there are some very wealthy people who can you know, strut about in their cars from one place to another and uh, they have so much of money to spend. But here this poor family uh, is not able to make both ends meet. They, they, they solely depend on this traffic which passes by on the highway to stop and buy their goods. So the Polish traffic, which has been mentioned by the poet, it represents the wealthier population and the owners of this shack, they are uh, the poor ones. 
the rustic ones. And this particular rich generation or the rich uh, people who pass by, they are completely obvious, oblivious to the plight of the poor family who's trying in vain to sell their goods. The second theme is of longing and unfulfilled dreams. You can feel it, you know, when you read the poem or when you go through it, you uh, feel that, you know, this family is yearning for a better life. They are hoping against hope to also, uh, you know, raise their standard of living because they've seen movies where uh, a lot of luxuries or at least comforts have been shown. So they also have that kind of thought in their mind. They also want to live the life which has been shown to them in movies and films. Okay, the third theme is about paternalism and loss of agency. Now, paternalism and paternity are very different terms. Paternalism means that those who are in authority, they do things as per their own uh, free will. They disregard completely the interests of the other party. So uh, the other party, they, they, they are always at a loss. They have to simply follow rules which have been set by their superiors or the ones who are governing that particular area. So uh, this poem particularly, it criticizes the city's well-meaning attempt to buy out the rural population. I mean, they are trying to make this rustic place into an urban place, but they completely disregard the interests of the people who are already living over there. It's not necessary that everybody wants to live in an urban setup. There are lots of people who love to be in villages, who love to be in their countryside setting. Right. So the fourth theme now is of longing and disappointment. Uh, the poem very successfully portrays the couple's desire for connection and recognition. They don't want people to just stop over there to buy their stuff. They want people to come and talk to them, to empathize with them, to share their experiences. But unfortunately, this does not happen. All right. So they are disappointed and their isolation is reinforced upon the two or whoever are there. The fifth theme is that of economic hardship. It's difficult for them to even survive. Forget about luxuries and comforts. They do not even uh, earn a decent amount which can feed them their three meals in a day. And uh, this particularly has been set up uh, in the... Uh, scenario of the Great Depression. So just for the sake of knowledge, the Great Depression uh, was a time between 1929 and 1941 when the world saw one of the greatest rece uh, recessions uh, in economics. So um, under this setup or in this setup, this poem very successfully portrays or paints the signs of meager offerings and reflects the desperation of the people who are living in a village background. Economic disparity, yes. Uh, these people are so poor, they can't even uh, earn to buy decent food. Whereas the Polish traffic, which is passing by, they have so much of money, they keep moving in cars, they keep burning their diesel and petrol, and uh, they are so wealthy but they are seemingly oblivious of the plight of their poor counterparts. So uh, as far as the speaker's perspective is concerned, he observes the scene with a mix of empathy and frustration. He, he empathizes with the poor workers uh, who are there in the shack and uh, he acknowledges their hardship and also understands their desire for a better life. Also, the poem hints at a larger societal issue where forced relocation and paternalistic solutions are questioned. Why should people be forced to follow a certain lifestyle? Why do not they have a free will to live and stay the way they like? If they are fond of living in a village, let them stay, let them be. You stay in an urban setting as per your wish, let the others live the way they want to. Don't force upon them your, free, your will, let them be free. The speaker also acknowledges uh, their own initial impulse to support city's solution, right? But then uh, he uh, immediately recognizes the potential loss of individual agency and the importance of persevering the rural way of life. We have to balance the two. 
if we are having a, an urban setting for those who have you know uh, qualified themselves to work in offices but then don't we need food and where will food come from it'll come from the fields so people have to stay in village to uh, produce uh, food for common people and for everybody i mean you can't live you can't survive without food the key points in the poem which have been highlighted there's a very vivid imagery to paint a realistic picture of the roadside stand, the traffic and the owners, their hopes and their despairs. It also employs a conversational tone, like he's talking to you and he invites you to engage in his own contemplations, like his viewpoints. Uh, there's a bit of irony also in the poem, like it would not be fair to say for a dole of bread where the owner's request appears modest, yet carries a deeper meaning of struggling to survive. When they say that it would not be fair to say for a dole of bread, I mean, not just a little piece of bread, but also there is a deeper meaning uh, to show that uh, how hard they have to struggle just to survive. Uh, the poem concludes with a very powerful reflection and uh, it requests the reader to, uh, you know, to contemplate, to consider how would they feel if they were subjected to a similar kind of forced life. I mean, just to push you out of a rustic uh, setup, you are being forced to live in an urban area which is not made to your liking. We like, or these people, the shack owners, they enjoy being in a village. They do not want to shift into a city. But now with th this kind of a situation, they may have to move out sooner or later. So to sum it up, it uh, it's a very poignant kind of uh, picture which is being uh, painted. There are complexities about the Great Depression. I mean, lots of themes have been mixed together to give this poem a very beautiful stand. Uh, the economic struggle, the yearning for better life, and also uh, it, it uh, makes you think about how to balance the two lives, the urban and the rural, the traditional. It has to be preserved because if we, if we forget our roots, we will not be able to prosper. This poem is a very thought-provoking one. It challenges the readers to consider the uh, issues of economic inequality, cultural preservation, and the ethics of government intervention in the lives of individuals. That sometimes government policies, they influence uh, most of the lives in a negative manner. So the government, before uh, issuing its policies, they must reconsider that whatever they think, whatever they decide, should be good for everyone, at least for the maximum of the population under them. It's also important to note that the poem can be interpreted in different ways, and the speaker's views on the situation are complex and nuanced. I mean, uh, it's it's as per your view. If you if you very strongly uphold uh, the urban setup, probably you will not agree with the poet. But if you think otherwise, then I'm sure you will appreciate Robert Frost's ideas. So thank you so much for being with me again today. Thanks for watching Eloquent English Enterprise. And before I wind up, here's a sneak preview uh, for my next video. Uh, I'll be talking about clauses and their classification. Basically, what's a phrase, what's a clause, what's a statement? So I'll start off with the difference first and I'll discuss a few clauses and then we'll move on probably to something uh, else, I mean, more deeper study of uh, clauses, right? So the next one is going to be short. It would be just an introductory video. And then uh, I'll uh, use, you know, uh, some exercises uh, where uh, we can practically uh, see how clauses are used and what's the main difference between phrases, clauses, and statements. So till then, it's me signing off with you uh, from uh, this uh, today's presentation. And uh, I hope you liked this particular video. So thank you, viewers. Thank you for being over here. And please, please, please do like the video if you feel that I have done justice to the topic. And uh, I'll look forward to your likes. And also, please do share uh, with people uh, in class 11 and 12 so that they at least get to know what literary analysis is all about. So till the next one, it's bye-bye.
Take care. God bless you all. Good night.